right, construction champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we're burning the damn house down twice a week, every Monday and Thursday, where we're not just talking about how you can have a better construction business, we're talking about how you can just be the champion that you were meant to be in every aspect of your life, where you happen to own a construction business. So, of course, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to bring on experts in the construction industry. And today, as always, I am super excited for our guest, Robert. It is great to have you on the show today. Hey, Ron. Thanks for having me on. Love the energy. Super excited to jump in. Awesome, man. So why don't you take uh, some time and tell the construction champions out there a little bit about yourself. What excites you about the construction industry? Yeah, uh, well, I, I tell you what, let me just share a little bit about how I ended up in this this racket, this space where I come from. I'm actually, I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. So I imagine sort of most, most of the listeners on here are probably in the U.S. Um, actually, but I, I Spent a lot of time in the U.S. as is right now. My sister lives in Pasadena, California, uh, but I come from a family of eleven kids. Um, and if if anybody knows Vancouver, on here, Vancouver has been a kind of a from the construction side of things has been a booming, busting city for many years now. Um, you know, they say the um, the bird or the 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 bird that represents the Vancouver is the crane, but uh, the construction crane, uh, because there's been cranes up in Vancouver for years and years and years. Like it just is. There's high rises everywhere. It's just uh, that kind of city, and that's kind of what I grew up in. My dad, uh, in fact, grew up very poor. Uh, his family uh, moved out to British Columbia to Vancouver when he was about 13 years old. He comes from a French background. That's my last name, Ducharme, is French. He didn't speak a lick of English. He had to learn English. Um, and then as he grew up, he was just was, was such an entrepreneur. He just went and he got working on construction sites and, and asked tons of questions. And, and, you know, the school of hard knocks learned everything and, and, and uh, that he needed to know and became a developer eventually and built 2,500 homes, a couple of hospitals. Um, and for me... Uh, there's 11 kids in my family. And for me, like at dinner time around the, you know, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but for us, this is before the cell phone, you know, my dad would set the phone in the middle of the, the dinner table and we would all sit around and have dinner. And my dad would be making all his phone calls from the day, calling the different trades, making sure that this guy was going to be there tomorrow at this time and that time and everything else. And um, it's really got to uh, vicariously just learn um, all of this stuff, my entire life growing up through my dad, uh, you know, over the dinner table, over mealtime um, together with our family to the point where I'd say, actually, I look at my my siblings now and eight out of the 11 are all entrepreneurs um, and some of them are in the construction industry as well. Um, where I'm at today, um, I first and foremost like to say I'm the father of uh you know, Brixton and Olivia, my little boy and my daughter who we adopted, and I'm the husband to Mary. Um, but on top of that, I'm also the CEO of Routezilla, which we can jump into, um, which is a scheduling software that is having a huge impact on the construction industry itself today. Awesome, man. Well, I'm excited for our conversation today. I'm, it always excites me when I have somebody on here that grew up around the construction industry. Uh, Cause I just think that just brings a whole nother perspective. Like I love the story of your dad making the calls from the dinner table, like making sure everybody's lined up. I'm sure that had something to do with maybe why you have a, a scheduling uh, software now is it make it a lot easier. No more having to make them phone calls, but what we're going to do is we're going to jump in. I'm going to ask you the million dollar question. And that is what makes a construction champion? Uh, well, you know, to me, you know, I talk about like they started off talking about like the phone on the table. We talk about communication, um, you know, when the cell phone came out and I was working in, you know, construction myself. And, uh, you know, I had a I had a service business. I had a landscape construction company. I was also building some houses. 
Um, and I started to get these, you know, then the cell phone came along and I started to get these headaches because the phone was on my ear all day long talking to everybody because um, that was the only, the, I mean, we just, we took communication to another level, but in the wrong way. But I think, you know, what makes a construction champion is their ability to communicate with all the key people, but to automate that communication, to make sure that we're not having conversations that we don't technically need to have, that everybody has every, access to everything they need and that the conversations that we have um, are important ones, are solving problems, are discussing things that can't be communicated. Like, let's just make sure that we're not, um, we're not having discussions with people about things that could easily just come down to planning better. Um, and let's focus our communication on ensuring that everybody understands the plan or that everybody comes together and communicates around any roadblocks or challenges that we come, come across. So I think, yeah, what makes a construction champion to me is just um, really like getting the phone off your ear um, and getting everything documented and organized in such a way where that our communications become more um, more strategic in terms of focusing on the things that really need to be discussed versus things that just should have been organized and and sort of delivered to everybody in an organized fashion ahead of time. Mm. I love that. And I just this now I have this picture stuck in my head of all the contractors and builders with the phone, just like here, just 24 seven. I But that's how that's how it, it still is. Like it's literally the phone came out and the construction industry has been on it ever since. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I'm saying like the phone is a fantastic resource and we got to use it. I'm just saying we got to know how to use it, you know? And I think that's maybe what was missing when it first came out is that it just became like anybody at any time would be able to get a hold of you on that call. And that was, that was okay. It's not okay. Like, <laughs> you know, you're driving yourself into the ground if that's, if you think that's okay, because it's not sustainable. Yeah, we don't, you don't you shouldn't have unlimited access. Like we went from limited access to then all of a sudden unlimited access. And it becomes, like you said, we have all these conversations that there's a lot of times no reason to be being had. It's something that was probably discussed. It's probably something that is somewhere, but no one knows exactly where that's at. But I, I like I like where you're headed with that and what you're talking about when you say like you're just doing it wrong. Like you're going to burn yourself out. You're going to kill yourself. Like, because whether it's a customer or an employee, you can end up on the phone 24 seven and probably 10% of that is stuff that actually matters. Again, I jump back to the example of my dad because in the, in the phone on the dinner table, uh, because the reality is, is, is he wasn't on the phone all day long. He had things organized in such a way and had to because he didn't have a cell phone. He didn't even have that option. So things had to be dialed in. Mm -hmm. And then he made phone calls in the evenings on the key. He only And he only had a limited amount of time each evening to make the phone calls on the key things that absolutely needed some level of communication and some discussion. And that's it. And that's the difference. So we so we came from a world where that was our only option. We had to be like that uh, to a world where we had these amazing communication devices that could take that to the next level, which would give us the ability to now even have to make less calls in the evenings and, and, or even during the day to actually communicating more than we need to because of our lack of organization. Now, I agree 100%. And I guess the question that comes to mind for me is, what do you think went wrong? Like we were, because I now, now I'm thinking about it. Like before the cell phone, like you, just what you said, you had no choice but to have your shit to your other. And then it's like, we get something that could make us even better. And instead, it kind of went the opposite direction. Yeah, I think, um, I think what we got away from and I'll use this um, example as like I can, and I, I used to do this um, a lot with my guys, but um, where you, you know, you could, you could, 
you could have somebody sort of lean on you, like one of your workers, for example, and to the point where they're like, hey, um, uh, just tell me what I'll, what needs to get done and I'll do it. OK. And and maybe some people like to operate that way. So you got, you know, in this case, hey, I want you to dig a trench from here to, you know, 100 feet over there. OK, well, I got catch you, boss. I'll do I'll do it. Um, you know, and then he'll come back when he's done that and do the next thing. But at the end of the day, that that person's not really empowered to think at all. They're just tasking. And so you just become like this taskmaster. You do that. You do this. You do like everybody's like a, an extra hand or finger for you. Right. Um, versus empowering. And, and when that's going on, obviously, everybody needs to communicate with you because you are every one of these guys is, is an extension of you. And and if you're not if they don't have that direct communication with you, they don't know what to do um, versus saying to someone. Um, we need to we need a wire that runs underground from here to that building over there, 100 feet away, because that building cannot uh, has to have the the you know the the generator system set up in it, and that can't run unless this wire is in the ground, um, and so we need to find a way to get that done. And I need and I need you to to find a way to get that power over to that building so the generator can run. And you see the difference is now this person is like, okay, boss, like I'll figure it out. I'll figure out how we're going to get that. And then come back, maybe come back to me and tell me how you're going to do it. I'd like to know, you know, maybe have some discussion around that if we need to. But but that's the the why, you know. And I think when that when you when you approach somebody in that way and you tell them like um, why it is you need something done versus what you need them to do, now you get then you eliminate half the conversation because now you've put this instead of them being a tasker and, and not even knowing how to think. You've given them the opportunity to think and actually to go out and eliminate all this back and forth and actually come back to you with actual an actual plan or real answers or, or something that they're ready to move forward on. Um, and they're they're instead of you having to like burn up all this brain power and your limited, you know, energy that you have in the day, you've just let somebody else use their own brain for that and let and freed up your own brain to think about other things. Um, so they, I mean, the, the consequences of it all is amazing, but I think that's what happened is that when people know that, um, they have that easy access to you and you're kind of the brains behind it all and everything else, they take advantage of it and they don't think for themselves. And so we kind of have lost to some degree, I think a level of empowerment, um, in the industry as a whole. Yeah, I would agree with that. I remember when I, like when we, so a lot of times when I wrote out new foreman, like there you go through the page where you, they're calling you like five times a day. And then eventually, you know, about a, a week of that for me is like, here's the deal. I'm not answering the phone. Like you're in the role because I know you can do it. You don't, don't have to use me to validate stuff. Like I'm here for emergencies, but like you want to be the run one run in the crew. If I didn't believe you could go out and carry the mission out. And you have, but for leader, like that can be hard to have that conversation because a lot of times as leaders, we still want that control, but we can't, you can't have all the control and grow a company without just letting go of some of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 by no means am I saying, um, you know, abdicate things or let tell people to do things and not know what's going on. Like I understand um, especially in construction, there's you need to be in in the loop and all that. Um, but it's a different kind of communication. It's a kind of communication where you're not actually limiting your ability to scale and to do more. Mm. And so, you know, one exercise that I like to do with my guys is I'll say, um, okay, what's the problem? Come to me with the problem, but come to me also with two ideas and one recommendation. Okay, and how we're going to solve the problem. So now you've just saved me a whole bunch of time. You've saved me a whole bunch of stress and everything else. And you've given the company just in that simple act, you've added so much value to the company that to scale by freeing up that mind space, by making this whole process. I mean, it comes down to process, you know, and more efficient by having this person empowered to come back to you and, and come up with a plan, 
um, identify problems, make recommendations. Um, otherwise, you're um, you're just you're, you're trying to solve everything and you're micromanaging and everything else. You're not empowering anybody to do anything and, and your ability to scale is pretty limited. Well, and everybody just always leans on you. Like you become the crutch in the situation, like because no one ever feels empowered to make a decision. So by with what you're talking about doing is like not only are you empowering them, you're then taking what they're talking about and validating one of those solutions, which is going to build confidence in them in the long term. Like they're like, man, well, man, I bring the stuff to Robert and he picks one of them. So like I must be barking up the right tree here. So I, I they, you start to build that confidence in your guys to where then they start doing that with their guys when there's a when they're running a crew out there. Well, put yourself in their shoes too. Imagine that, you know, think about the times maybe growing up where you felt like your parents were just saying like telling you like do this, do that, do this. And you're like, oh man, like stop telling me what to do. You know, versus not, I mean, do you think your employees don't feel the same way, whether they know what to do or not? I mean, nobody wants to feel like somebody is just dictating their every move. You know, you want to, you want them to feel free. You want them to feel like you believe in them. Like, you know, that they have ability and all that. And, and I mean, that's when you're going to get, when somebody is feeling free and empowered is when they're at their best. That's when you're going to get the most out of them. And that's what you want to get to. You want to get to a level where you're, you're essentially just coaching them and empowering them and not sort of dictating them. You know, we've seen, uh, I mean, lots of examples of this globally, you know, countries where, you know, there's dictatorships, but their ability to innovate as a country is very limited. But that's one of the beauties of, you know, that we have here in, in the U S and in Canada is our ability to innovate because people are free to try things and to think. Um, and so there, there's lots of evidence out there as to why you want people to feel empowered um, and how much more innovative your business can be and efficient it could be as a result. Mm. Absolutely. And speaking of being innovative, I think that's the perfect transition into talking yeah. about what you're doing now because you're re innovating how all of, all of this works. And I, I yeah. think it's pretty exciting. So why don't, why don't you kind of just tell a little bit about that, what you're doing now? Yeah. So I we talked a little bit about communication and that whole piece. So my company now is, is routezilla.com. Um, we just did a, a massive uh, partnership with Google that, that everybody's going to want to hear about, but I'll get to that uh, in a minute. Um, it's a bit of a bit of a game changer. We've also worked with companies like Tesla, um, where on the scheduling side of things, and I'll get into how that's relevant in the construction side of things, uh, but how we started off. So a little bit of context. So how I, I mean, I've grown up in this construction background. How did I get into this whole tech side of things? Why am I working with Google? How, why have I helped Google? Why have I helped Tesla? Uh, all of that. Um, if I was to jump back into 2009, I bought an irrigation uh, service company. So I had my landscape construction thing going on. I had a couple houses that we were building at that time as well. And then the economy took a shift and I bought this irrigation company and I had 700, it was the month of, of September. So we're in the, you know, in a cold, colder climate. So anybody with an irrigation system has to have it winterized um, in the month of October or their pipes will freeze, meaning we have to run air through all the pipes, blow all the water out before it gets too cold. And then, you know, the irrigation systems start freezing up and breaking pipes, busting and that whole bit. So we had bought this business. We had 700 places to be or systems to winterize in one month's time and four people to do it. And you want to talk about communication, like um, off the charts, communication, blow up, bust, whatever. Um, we had to get a hold of all of these homeowners. And we had to make sure they had their water turned off before we came. We had to make sure that um, that our routes getting from one location to the next were efficient or else we wouldn't be able to get all of these jobs done. Um, and on top of that, um, it was kind of like, it's kind of like a commodity. So like people are only willing to pay a certain amount. It's like a fixed price type service. And so people are only willing to pay a certain amount for that service. 
Um, so we had to do, do it very efficiently. So, I mean, our labor costs and our, our the amount of money we we're spending on gas and, and compressors, which we we're using to winterize, but all of that had to be dialed in and it had to be efficient. We ended up having three people in the office, phoning, emailing, texting, um, to get a hold of people, uh, to book in their times, all this back and forth, um, to the point where we made no money. So we had 700 jobs in a month, guys like, yeah, like, and I thought, recession proof, you know, people need this work done no matter what. Um, we made nothing. And I said, okay, um, that's fine. We're going to actually, we're going to fix this problem or we're going to get rid of this business because it's it's not what we thought it was going to be. So we went looking for a solution and we didn't find anything out of the box that solved this problem. And so that was kind of the inspiration to build Rootzilla. That following year, um, what we did is we built um, something very, very simple where you could, you create a link and you could send it out to all your customers. But the first thing they have to do when they get the link to schedule is they have to enter their address or their, their zip code into the link. When they enter their zip code, we give them which times uh, are available or left available for us to come and winterize their system. With the idea being, could we go from three people in the office down to one, trying to coordinate this whole thing by just letting people schedule themselves. And to do that, we had to have a means to take in geography into account when scheduling. So they had to, we had to make it so they entered a, a zip code so we knew where they were. We would only offer them available times when we had somebody that was going to be going to that specific zip code and whatever days. Anyhow, we didn't know though, would people do this sort of thing back then? Like would they click this link? Would they think it was sketchy? You know, anyways, we collected 400 email addresses from our customer base. We sent out an email on a Tuesday, and by Thursday, we had over 200 uh, jobs booked without making a single phone call, without a single back and forth. Um, and that was kind of the birthplace of it all. Um, many years later, like as we got rolling along and eventually just decided to uh, build a tech company around this whole piece, along came Tesla. And Tesla said, hey, we're having a problem here. We've got, um, we've got, you know, thousands of requests coming in for service each day. And instead of, you know, you bringing your, your car to the dealership for service, like we come to you at your home or office. So each technician's got, you know, five to 10 places they gotta be each day. And this whole back and forth, texting, phoning, routing, all of this between our admin team and the customer that needs us to come to their location is killing us. And so, they started using Rootzilla within overnight, within a, sorry, within 30 days, we had almost overnight, we had over 300 Tesla employees using Rootzilla. And what they were doing was when people requested service, they would send an autoresponder back with the link saying, here, click this link, enter where you want us to come. We'll give you the available times and schedule it out that way. And it's all done. Way you go. We did a little case study with them, over 50,000 appointments across New York, Texas, Arizona, Colorado. Uh, we saved their admin team an average of 16 minutes per appointment by eliminating all the back and forth that was going on, trying to coordinate these times, um, trying to coordinate the scheduling, this back and forth communication, communication overload, unnecessary communication, as we talked touched on uh, you know, a little bit earlier here in the podcast. We also... And they um, doubled the amount of appointments that their techs were doing each day from two to three to five or six. Why? Because their techs were actually going out with schedules that were either there was too much driving between appointments, which Rootzilla eliminates, um, or they were just going out with a schedule that wasn't filled up because with all the, the communication bogged down and trying to coordinate things, they just weren't getting people locked in at certain times quick enough to ensure that every tech that went out had a full schedule. Uh, and so pretty amazing in terms of efficiency and all that, what Rutila can do. However, when you go, when you jump back to why um, people need scheduling like this, and you say, well, obviously they need a demand um, to even need, you know, to head to fix the scheduling problem. And then they need efficiency if they've actually got a scheduling problem that they fixed and they want to take their business to the next level. So I like to jump back to, where people, where Rootzilla is the best fit for, you know, construction companies now. And so with the biggest, most common use cases when it comes to things like 
free estimates or getting people in the door where you got to go out there and you got to, you want to get as many estimates booked a day as possible. Maybe you've only got one estimator, maybe you got five, whatever it is, we can accommodate that. Um, but the partnership that we did with Google, and this is the game changer, is that during COVID, uh, Google did this thing with um, OpenTable for restaurants, where basically OpenTable could go and add a big blue reserve a table button to the Google business profile of any restaurant. Kicker was he had to get the button through OpenTable. So OpenTable is the one that adds it to your Google business profile. Um, this has gone so well to the point where OpenTable has, like, I don't know, 31% of the restaurant industry in Canada and the U.S., now and uh, and if you go through and you search for restaurants on maps or in a Google search, you will see most of them will have that reserve a table button. So Google's taken this and said, hey, you know what? Um, we want the consumer to get what they need through Google search and go through Google Maps. We don't want them to have to go to Yelp or to go to Home Advisor or go somewhere else to get what they need. They want that we want the consumer to trust the Google experience. So we want to make the Google business profile for construction companies, we want to make it more meaningful. And what's the missing piece? Well, you can't book somebody through the profile. You could call them or you could get a link to their website or you could go down a rabbit hole if you want. You can see all the reviews, but you can't. Google wants it so that the experience begins and ends in Google. So we save all of this unnecessary back and forth communication, phone calls or, or whatever it might be that don't necessarily need to happen, especially in the case when it comes to an estimate where you've got somebody who's read all the reviews, they've seen everything about you, they just want to find out, hey, when can you come take a look? And so Google's made it so that Rootzilla um, is one of the first scheduling systems in the world that can go and add this book online button to your Google business profile. Um, this is so new that um, if you go through Google search and maps right now and you look for construction companies or any type of home service business and you look for that big blue book online button, chances are you won't see it. But what an opportunity uh, it is for the industry right now. Those that do get the button, I know a big thing is, you know, businesses want to stand out uh, from their competitors to be the business that stands out by having this big blue button that nobody else has and like, hey, um, this company here, I can book online and this one I can't. Um, of course, we all want that advantage. You know, we had a company that has a, a, uh, a customer that has a tree service company in New York, and he got his big blue book online button added to his Google business profile. Um, and he's like, hey, I'm the only tree service company in New York that has this button. Hmm. Like, how about that? I talk about, you know, standing out from the competition. What's also interesting, and I... I'm gonna get this uh, this this stat wrong, perhaps, um, but I, we just pulled it recently. But one of the shifts that happened during COVID, and I think it's sixty or seventy percent of consumers will go with the business that makes online scheduling easy. So if you're wondering, like, why is Google leaning in on this? Why is Google partners partnered with Rootzilla? Why does Google think that construction companies need this big blue button added to to their profile? This is why. It says the consumer prefers to go with the company that makes online scheduling easy. Mm. And so to be one of the first to have Rootzilla, to have the button, to have it added to your profile, to stand out from the competition, to actually meet the needs of the consumer and to be in sync with this whole shift that Google is pushing right now to not have to use Home Advisor, not have to use Angie's List, not have to use Yelp, get everything you need through the Google experience um, it's a pretty unique opportunity, something like the construction industry um, has never come across, and I've certainly never come across yet in my lifetime. And that's, uh, you know, in a, nut in a long winded way of describing what I do, uh, that's that's what I'm most excited <laughs> right now. And, uh, but what we're doing here with Rootzilla, and I would love anybody who wants to try it out, go to rootzilla.com and sign up. As simple as that. And our team will help you out and take you from there and, and get you your button. That was going to be my next question is how can people contact you, follow you, or uh, do any of that? There you go. So awesome, man. Well, I loved it. It's been a fantastic show. You you have tons of knowledge for the industry. And thank you for taking the time and being on the show today. 
Thank you, Ron. And uh, thank you, all your listeners out there for taking the time. Again, rootzilla.com, R-O-U-T-E-Z-I-L-L-A.com. Awesome, man. Thank you. All right, construction champions, another episode where we talked about some amazing things, especially when it comes to the overload of communication. You know, when Robert was talking about how it used to be and his dad sitting there doing these phone calls at night because during the day he didn't have access to it. Like people just didn't have access. So he had to put stuff to other so it ran efficiently. And I guess my question to everybody listening, the entire construction industry is like, why aren't we doing that now? Like we have the capacity, we have the capabilities, but we become such micromanagers in needing to have our hands in everything that we've lost every sense of just being proactive. I know I've said it on here many times. I got it from when I was at boot camp at Paris Island. The seven Ps, proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. That is doable today like think about it like if you started putting stuff to your other and organizing it and setting the expectation that we're not just all going to stand around and talk on the phone to each other all day long anytime something happens we're not just picking up the phone and we're just calling or and we just start operating like we used to and i'm not talking about having to go back to when robert's dad was doing this I look back at when I started in the construction industry and I was working up in Northern Michigan and we didn't even have cell phone service, but the job still had to get done. And it wasn't like I was going to keep leaving the job site all the time because I had a question and I needed to go find service somewhere. Like that is the mindset we have to start to have as an industry is like, there's all this great technology out there. But we still have to utilize it effectively. We can't let it just run everything around us and then create an environment where all businesses just can't sustain without either having these conversations or just the overabundance of caution that people have because with technology came you know, an environment where we just don't empower people like we used to. People don't have the trust in their own abilities because they're just not thrown out there. And I don't say that in a netica way. I know a lot of times when people look at it like, oh, you just don't want to throw the guys out there. And then next thing they no, that like, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is putting guys out there that can do the job. You have confidence in them doing the job. And then here's the magical part. You let them do the damn job. And then maybe you check in with them at night or the next morning and you don't create the precedence of all these phone calls. Because if I had to guess, it probably all started because it wasn't them reaching out to you. It was you reaching out to them all the time. And then it just became this okay cycle that now we're just all stuck in. So champions, take a moment, think about that. Go look in the mirror and let's start changing how we use technology. Sometimes it's good to go back and do things how we used to do it and then use technology that lets us be more effective. But it all has to work to your other. This is the construction industry. We're builders and we're fixers. Let's get out there and get it. And until next time, be the champion you're meant to be. Hey, construction champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum here, and I want to talk to you about how you can automate all of your marketing. We've had so many people on here talk about getting the systems in place. Well, we have partnered with Build 12 and Construction Champions podcast, Les O'Hara, the founder. What really excites me is his 30 years in the industry. And now he's built a system to be able to nurture your leads and continue to utilize that. I personally use the system myself. Build 12 is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of value in there. And it's a way to start getting away from Angie's list and all of that kind of stuff and start actually creating your own leads every day and have a system 
for them. So go on our website, check out the show notes, go check out Build 12 and what it can do for the front end of your business today. It's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend going and meeting with Les and his son, Devin, and talking to him about what they built for their own business so the rest of the industry can take benefit from that. Here on Construction Champions, we're all about helping each other out in what is better than contractors helping contractors. I say nothing. So let's go take this to the next level. Go check out Build 12. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Les or his son, Devin. We're here to help. We want to continue to grow the industry.